heard today, you've heard throughout the conference, a number of different references, allusions to economic structures and, and how important those are in our dealing with the environmental crisis. We're going to talk more explicitly again about that at the 2 o'clock session to kind of help us make the transition to that. Uh, Kenneth Cousins is going to come. Kenneth is particularly concerned with the, the core structures that lead to our social structures that result in the kinds of problems and issues that we're facing. Greetings, everybody. Greetings. My name is Ken Cousins, and briefly, my background is for the last 25 years, I've been studying fundamentals and the foundation of, as John said, the structure of law and the structure of money, because that permeates everything. When Tina was telling her story yesterday about the lady with the chickens, and she said that, I'm not into politics, this is about chickens. Most people would say, well, I'm not into law. This is about my project, or this, or that, the other. But what most people don't understand and don't really take awareness of is that law permeates everything, OK? Uh, just as David was talking about uh, concrete and rebar, the thing that holds the concrete together. Law is what holds us all together. So when I started studying law, it reflected on my lifelong study of several subjects, primarily esoteric systems, and as well as history. So once I started getting into law, I realized that I had to go back in history. And that's what I refer to as the foundations of law. Law as we have it today is basically the story of history. History is the evolution by purposeful direction of a small group of people to create an underlying structure out of which emerged a system in the last 500 years based on what occurred the previous 5,000 years of what we call money. Okay. Uh, the other day I was talking with, with a couple of people, uh, Scott over there, and he mentioned that coming to this conference is like when he remembered or when he went to a summer session for seven weeks to learn Greek. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is essentially take a summer session of learning Greek and multiply it by about 10,000. Okay. <laughs> so keeping that in mind, it took me 25 years with a lot of help and a lot of support with associates, partners, strategic alliances, and so forth, to peel off the layers of what I'm going to synopsize in 10, 15 minutes. So this is about, our track is about political collapse. First of all, to understand the nature of law and money and history, history is the flow and the evolution of something that I refer to as law to create something that we call money for a specific reason, to basically bind and control the global human population as an asset or a resource that can be uh, directed to extract the natural resources and add value, intellectual property, property and labor to create value. Buildings, farms, everything we take as our modern world. And also at the same time to build our prison planet. In order to put that population into that prison, and control it just like any other prison, with trustees, wardens, rules, restrictions, and all the rest of that. And if you haven't noticed, we're in a prison planet. Okay. In this conference, we're talking about seizing an alternative, which is great, except we don't know our starting point. And if you don't know your starting point, and in fact, if you're starting from a false premise, then you have a problem. It's what I liken to, the, to a, an example. Uh, 30 miles west of here is the Santa Monica Bridge. I mean the pier. If we were on that pier facing west and we intended to go to New York and we started walking forward, we would be taking a very long trip off of a very short pier and we would be falling into the ocean. We'd be battered by the waves into the, the pylons and the barnacles 
and we would be thrashed and destroyed. Okay, so when we talk about the creation of money and the flow of history and all of that, and where we're at today, and we're talking about season and alternative, what we're really not understanding is that we don't know where we're standing. We don't know where we're starting, and we don't know the direction in which we need to go in order to get to where we're going. Okay, does that make sense? Sure. So let's begin. Okay, I put this quote up here. It's a Supreme Court where it says U.S. or S. Dot C. T. That means it's a Supreme Court decision. It essentially means it is the highest court statement of reality. It says the U.S. citizen, citizens of the District of Columbia, residing in one of the states of the Union, are classified as property and franchises of the federal government as a, quote, individual entity. Now, you might say to yourself, but I'm not a citizen of the District of Columbia, and that's where you're wrong, okay? You may say to yourself, I'm a living being standing on the ground on the land, and therefore I'm not a property, and I'm not a franchise, and I, I may consider myself an individual, but you don't understand the definition of the word individual. Individual is an artificial construct in the legal system in which we exist. Now, I'm going to talk about the United States, but you have to understand the United States is a corporation through which every other nation on the planet is constructed as a corporation channeled through Washington, D.C., which is the District of Columbia. So when we talk about franchises and property and artificial corporate constructs in the United States, we're talking about it worldwide. There's only two or three nations that are not corporations or not overlaid by a corporate structure that is not organic in its nature. It is the same mechanistic construct that we've been hearing about all weekend long. So the other, actually last night I was talking to a few other guys uh, who, are, who were planning to come to this talk and I posed the question to them, how many corporations are there on this planet? And one said 10,000. I said, come on, you don't think it's that low, do you? And the other said 50,000, 100, you know, a million. You know, I kept going like this, 10 million, 50 million, billions and billions. And I said, that's great, except you're wrong. There is only one corporation on this planet. Okay, how many of you knew that before I just said that? You're cheating. <laughs> She's one of my partners. Okay. <laughs> One corporation, it's called the Crown Corporation. It's in the city of London, which is not London, England. It's a one mile square enclave that is a sovereign city state, which is only one of three on the whole planet. The other two are Vatican City and Washington DC. It's the tripartite or the triumvirate of power and sovereignty on this planet, okay? Everything that descends from that one corporation, starting with what we're called and what are still called joint stock companies. And the joint stock aspect of it is it's a crown charter. It belongs to the crown, which is not the same as the, the man or the woman who sits on the throne. Okay. And with those capital investors creating joint stock to access stock equity and value or property. Now I would also suggest to say, how many landowners are on this planet, okay? How many of you own your house? Do you know you're lying? Okay, none of you own your house. Nobody owns land on this planet. There's one landowner and it's the same thing, the Crown Corporation, okay? Now that tripartite structure that I mentioned was essentially initiated in the year 1302 by a papal bull, which is a proclamation or a decree by the papacy. It's called Unum Sanctum. And for the next 200 or so years, more papal bulls were issued. And the essential element of those papal bulls was to claim that all land and all flesh and all souls belong to it. Okay, 
And because we only have 15 minutes more thereabouts, I can't go into the detail. But I can tell you I have 25 years under my belt, and my friend over there has decades herself, and many of us aggregating hundreds and maybe even thousands of years of research. We could show you chapter and verse of where this is laid out. But you think that law is singular and in one place. It is all over the place. So when I said that I've studied esoteric systems, esoteric systems operate on a principal uh, maxim, which is hidden in plain sight. Okay, so law is the same thing. It is hidden in plain sight because all of law is fundamentally a matter of contract. Contract establishes jurisdiction. And in order to be a valid contract, you have to have several elements. Full disclosure, meeting of minds, uh, equal consideration, balanced. If I contract with somebody, I give him a chicken or you know, 50 chickens, he gives me a cow, we consider it equal, that's a good contract. Okay? But if his cow has mad cow disease and he doesn't tell me, that's not full disclosure. Well, believe it or not, well, I've come up through the ranks with all the law and the patriot movements, sovereignty movements, and most of them scream about fraud and um, non-disclosure and things like that. But what I came to understand in just the last several years is that's not true. It is all fully disclosed. It's there for the finding, but it is fragmented in a sense because it's spread out over time and space in many places. So my work of the last 25 years has been to find those pieces and integrate it into an integrated comprehensive whole that distills it down and saves all of you those 25 years or maybe a lot longer. Because if we don't understand how this all works, we do not understand how we will have the capacity and the standing and the status to do what we're talking about being here, what we want to do. Okay, in terms of standing and status, this talks about that your property owned by the District of Columbia. So how did that happen? Okay, well, from the Unum Sanctum in the early 1300s, there's a, a progression in the historical flow leading up to uh, the founding of the city of London, 1666, which next year will be 350 years. Well, we've heard that number this weekend, 350. Isn't that a coincidence? Well, I'll tell you something. There are no coincidences. And I'm going to give you a quote. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who basically should know, stated at one point, nothing in history is an accident. It is all purposeful. It is all by design. So when we talk about political collapse here, we're talking about by design. When we're talking about bonded attachment as collateral to a perpetual debt system, which you think is money and property and franchise relationships, then we're talking about how those national corporations were designed to expand to a certain point, creating a monetary system that was uh, insurmountable debt and collapse it. And this has happened over and over through what we would call the flow of civilization. Civilizations, Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, Rome, etc., were all raised up. A monetary system was put in place. That monetary system expanded so that the uh, entrainment of the population and the extraction of resources and wealth could be outpictured and manifested and built. And then it was collapsed. And every single collapse was done on a natural mathematical cycle that has been known and perfected over thousands of years. We are at the end point of that natural mathematical cycle. Okay? We are in the inevitability and the absoluteness of the collapse of a debt system. Okay? So if you're talking about what we're talking about this weekend, whether it's a public bank or uh, financing projects or any and all of those things, how can we do it with a debt-based system that is designed to collapse and it's well advanced in its collapsed state? We cannot, okay? So skipping tracks for a moment, going back in history, we think we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave. It is actually the land of the fee and the home of the slave, okay? 
We are the most enslaved population on this planet, and we think we're free. Okay, And there's nothing more dangerous than a being or an animal or whatever who thinks it is free when it is actually enslaved. So how did we get here to be enslaved? We think we're in the United States of America. Well, do you know who owns the United States of America, of America since the beginning? Give me a moment. Okay, how, how many of you heard of something called the Treaty of Paris? Oh, good. All right, well, this is the Treaty of Paris. It was supposedly the treaty that uh, created the agreement of peace between the king, George III, and the United States that had uh, supposedly won the Revolutionary War. Okay, how many of you think we won the Revolutionary War? Okay, it depends how you look at it. Militarily, we may have won on a temporary basis, but there's another treaty I'm going to show you in a minute from 1782 called the Treaty of Versailles that established an agreement between the United States, which existed under the Articles of Confederation, that created a perpetual union. The Articles of Confederation established that the name of the Confederation would be capital T, which means it's part of the formal name, the United States of America. It was passed in 18, or ratified in 1871. It established a body called the United States in Congress Assembled. So in Congress Assembled means that it was the, say, the confederated unified persona of the United States of America, of the Confederacy. It entered into the Treaty of Versailles in 1782 and agreed to 18 million levers of gold that were due to the king, that the payments were starting in 1787, which is when the Constitution was established. So in 1783, this treaty was established, and I've highlighted the most important phrase. It's in the beginning. Prince George III, King George III, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, Dukes of Brunswick and Lundberg, here's the important part, arch treasurer and prince elector of the Holy Roman Empire and of the United States of America, small t. That's a different entity, okay? So you have the arch treasurer, which means the top treasury, the issuer of the money from the city of London at a, of an office called the Office of the Exchequer, right next to something called the Four Inns of Court, which is where the bar associations issue from. Bar stands for British Accredited Registry. Registry, the root is regis, which means it belongs to the crown or the king, but specifically the crown. So when you register your property or your child or your home or your car, you are putting it in the registry, which means the property belongs to the king. That includes your body, which is initially registered by the record of vital statistics that we call a birth certificate. That birth certificate creates the franchise that puts you into the United States of America in Washington, D.C., and therefore you are owned as chattel property, which means you're movable and you're controlled and controllable. We'll get to that in a minute. So arch treasurer of the Holy Roman Empire, which was established formally in the year 962 between the Pope and Otto the Great, who was from the Carolinian or the Charlemagnean bloodline. Okay? And they made an agreement to meet at the end of time. The prince elector would be the king or the crown, and the king controls all the land. And the pope or the Vatican or the Holy See controls all the law. The law is what binds us as monetary bonded surety, which means we're the guarantor, we're the collateral to all the monetized debt. So there are two lines in history, the line of the king and the line of the priest. So this was established in 962. It's known as the First Reich. The Second Reich is when uh, Wilhelm Kaiser unified the German states in, eight, in the 1860s. We know what the Third Reich is, but what we don't know is that the United States was always intended to be the Fourth Reich because of this line, because the Holy Roman Empire owns the United States of America. 
And another thing which we won't have time for me to bring up is in the Constitution, it always refers to the United States, except for two places. And I'll get to the second one in a moment. It's actually the first one. The second one is in Article 2 that describes the president. It says he's the president of the United States of America. That has just been established four years earlier that George III, which means the crown, the crown corporation, is the arch treasurer and the prince elector. The elector is what holds the land. The prince elector is the one that holds the, the titular head of the electoral body. And you can only be an elector if you're on the land. So in our opening um, plenary with the, the elders from the, the Southern California nation, the Tunga, he talked about returning to the land. But do you know you cannot return to the land because you've been lifted off the land? You're in something called the civil body, which is, comes from the Roman civil code, and it's called the civitus, which now is referred to as the public, okay? And so I'll get to that in a moment. But it says the Holy Roman Empire, etc. That's a big word there we don't have time to go into. But nonetheless, and of the United States of America. So this country was founded owned that, that structure called the United States of America that the president was the president of, was started, owned by the crown. So let's look at the word United States, United States in Congress assembled. In the preamble, which is the other place where the United States of America is referenced, it says, we the people of the United States, which is referring to the United States and Congress assembled representing the perpetual union, et cetera, et cetera, do establish and ordain this constitution for the United States of America. It's a contract with the crown. It established the federal entity that then is also known as the United States, but it's a different United States. Because in the Treaty of Versailles in 1782, that established those 18 million levers that were not paid, so therefore it went into default within months after this was passed, that the United States that's referenced in the Constitution is known as a constitutor. That definition of that word is one who takes on the obligation or debt of another. So the United States, the federal government or the federal entity, started its life as a bankrupt as a subsidiary of the United States of America, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire, and et cetera. There's a lot of detail, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm going over here, skipping, because of the lack of time. The point is that the fiat money system, which means disconnected from substance, gold and silver, or a, a parity relationship to value, where one unit of measure equals one unit of value. When you separate that, you go into fiat, you have an exponentially expanding system that the mathematics with the interest will inevitably, within about 65 to 70 years, collapse. Okay. In the United States, or our country, and hence the world, we've gone through three cycles. This was begun in 1789. The first 70-year cycle, which is the, the natural cycle, which is also in international law, the period when bankruptcy can either be settled or renewed. So this country, or this, the United States of America, started as a bankrupt, and in 1859, it had to renew that bankruptcy. And then what happened? Civil War and many things after that. So initially, this United States of America and the United States as the constitutor, because in Article 6, it says, henceforward, all debts and engagements previously valid against the Confederacy, meaning the debts from 1782, are now valid against the United States. But that United States had no assets, so it was insolvent. But it had no collateral either, so the progression was to get the collateral in place. So after 1859, we have the Civil War. What issued after the Civil War is a couple of key things. One is the Civil Rights Movement, I mean, uh, Civil Rights Act. The first one was 1866. And then something called the 14th Amendment, which established that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof essentially are in that jurisdiction, okay? 
So what was happening is the first stage of lifting the population off the land to put them into the civil body to become the franchise and the property. The other key thing was that in section four, it says in the 14th amendment that um, the, debt, the debt of the United States can never be val validly challenged. Okay, so it's inviolate, including the obligations for pensions and bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion. This is a very key point. Why? Because in 1863, something was issued by Lincoln, by one of his um, uh, plenipotentiaries, uh, called Lieber, Franz Lieber, and it's called the Lieber Code. And it's the code by which military occupation will be maintained by a military occupier. Well, guess what? This foreign entity, the United States slash the United States of America, is foreign to the Perpetual Union and the Union of States. From the Civil War onward, it became a military occupier. So what you don't know is we are all under military occupation. Now, the nature of the Lieber Code is that in military occupation, the military must maintain all the public systems and issue what is necessary to maintain that for the civil population. And it can establish rules if that population becomes hostile or belligerent. Now, we'll fast forward because in 1899, the uh, a treaty was issued from The Hague defining for the international body, the globe, all the nations, the nature of a belligerent. And today in all the terrorist wars, what do we hear? Belligerents, insurgents, things like that. Because the United States, through its military commercial construct in the Washington, D.C. Uh, city-state, is the military occupier of the planet through the convergence of all the national and bankrupt corporations, then basically our whole planet is under military occupation. It's self-evident, okay? We can see it as it operates in the world today. The other thing is perpetual war and perpetual emergency. And this is where we're facing backwards because Catherine in the beginning of the plenary talked about an author named Klein who is calling for a national emergency. Well, the problem is under a natural, national emergency uh, emergency, all power is vested in the military commander during the occupation. So going back to belligerency and insurgency in the 14th Amendment, the entirety of our judicial and monetary system is designed to maintain the military occupation and something called what became from 1933 on public policy. Public policy is for the maintenance of the collateral, the bonded surety, which is all of us and all the property and all the chattel in this country and on the planet within the construct of public policy. Now hold that thought, I'm gonna back up a second, okay? So 1899, treaty defining belligerency. 1907, another Hague Treaty that reflected the Lieber Code internationally. World War I starts, the United States enters in 1917 and passes an act on October 6 of that year called the Trading with the Enemy Act to define how to trade or operate with enemies who may have uh, trade with the United States that are now enemies. It excluded persons in the United States. But in 1933, when FDR came into um, into office, and he is uh, lauded as, as one of the great presidents of our country. Well, on the one hand, he did a lot of good things, okay? But it was all systematic, and he's the one that I quoted, that he said nothing in history happens by accident. So that expansion and collapse, remember that 70-year period. The last one was 1859, it ended. What's the next date? 1929. Purposeful collapse because it went from 1859 and what preceded uh, or what followed after that in which the land was collateralized to the debt. And then in 1929, the persons were collateralized to the debt. The property, the franchises, the individual entities that I started with. And so in 1933, when he took office, he proclaimed a national emergency. 
And in the Trading with the Enemy Act, there's a phrase that was activated on the date, March 9th, 1933, three days after he took office, in something that was issued called the Emergency Banking Relief Act. The very beginning of that says that the provision in 1917 that excluded the U.S. citizen person from being an enemy is now amended to say it is an enemy. So we were defined as an enemy of the state. Okay, but that's U.S. person. What is a U.S. person? It was, it's created as a franchise off of the birth certificate, which is the record that then holds the debtor that creates all the debt during the course of your life. But what you don't understand, this gets into the monetary base of it, is at the bottom of that is an estate. Now let's go back to 1666. After the city of London, after the great fire of 1665, a year later, the city of London began to be built. There was an act passed called the Sesta KV Act. Sesta KV means a number of things. We could take it literally from the French and the Latin. It's Setu KV. You are that which lives. You are the life. It is who we are as living beings. But also it means the beneficiary of what? An estate. We are all beneficiaries of an estate. When we are born, we are born into an estate. And because we don't have the time, I can't explain how and why. But basically, our mothers abandon us, put us as collateral into a trust that becomes the franchise, a vessel in commerce, and we abandon our estate. Okay, we do not perfect our estate. And without, obviously, the time to go into how this is, it'll take you, if you wish to proceed to learn this, at least six months, if not a year or longer. But the bottom line is that when that estate is created and the franchise is created on top of it, the underlying value that is created is in that estate. The debt is like a secured, bonded, uh, uh, bonded we, we as the living beings are the bonded surety, that means we guarantee it. The franchise itself is a debtor. So from the birth certificate, I know I'm out of time, but if you can stick with me, for about 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you something that you really need to, to hear. Anybody who needs to go, please do go. Um, so all the debt that's created by the entire Federal Reserve System is bonded, securitized debt of the franchise. It is underwritten by the value of the estate. We have the capacity to claim that estate, and that's what our work is about, among other things. Okay. Um, obviously, for the, the issue of time, I can't get into all that detail, but this is examples of all the pieces that are the building blocks of the legal monetary system over hundreds and really thousands of years. So back to the 1933, the Emergency Banking Relief Act, that was a declaration of emergency. And as it amended the Trading with the Enemy Act, it gave the president singular authority pre-approved. If you read the beginning of that act, it says Congress pre-approves, according to the Trading with the Enemy Act, everything the president says. That's why executive orders have the power that they do, because it's a military construction of a occupied, um, conquered territory and people, which we are, and the whole world, because once the Bretton Woods system was put in place, all the Federal, Reserves be, the Federal Reserve notes became the reserve currency of all the central banks. Every central bank in that national corporation that I reference is how all those populations are bonded. So that was a fixed rate of exchange. In 1971, that fixed rate of exchange was removed by Nixon, and then we got the petrodollar, which made a, a parallel relationship between the expansion of the consumption of energy equal to the expansion of the Federal Reserve note base of the world currency system. So we were consuming our own demise by what our consumer society operated under. That too has a lot of detail and so forth. So, I'm going to cut all of that short ending here because of the time constraint.